Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, and we're going to continue looking into Daniel chapter 11, verse 15 and 16. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all the things that you've been teaching us from your word, and that we can come together each morning to study, to ask for your guidance. We pray for those who are searching for truth, that you can help them in their day-to-day -day struggles and in their search um, to discern precious from the bottom. We know that there's much confusion, not just in the world, but also within the church and within this movement. And so we need your help. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. So <clears throat> what we have been doing is going through uh, Daniel chapter 11, the kingdom of Greece, and uh, looking at the line, which we're eventually going to have to to finish uh, drawing this out. Um, but in this line, what we have recognized is that Raphi and Paneum are events that are still future. If Raphia, uh, either Raphia has begun on some level, as a zoom into Raphia, we have events. That is, if we zoom into midnight on the line of Jeff, the line that Jeff had from 2016, his line with 9-11, midnight, midnight, Christ Sunday law. Um, we should be able to see, and I'm just thinking some ideas that I want to um, kind of examine a little bit. But we know when we are studying the book of Judges, so let's go back to thinking about the book of Judges. The book of Judges was clearly a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message on what we would call 9-11. That is, it wasn't 9-11 as the formalization of the first message, but it was 9-11 as the arrival of the second and in doing that, we came to recognize that 9-11 and 11-9-19 uh, uh, are, are really the same way, Mark. That is, when we talk about the arrival of the second angel's message at 9-11, we're really talking about this period that leads us to 11-9. Because in, with the arrival of the second angel is the Sunday law. It's quite clear in the spirit of prophecy. And that when the second angel joins the third, we have the Sunday law and it swells into a loud cry and leads to the close of probation for the world. Yet Jeff has had 9-11 apply to, uh, uh, to Revelation 18 or Revelation 18 apply to 9-11. Now, if we look at these various kingdoms, so we have Persia, now we have Greece, and then we have Rome. Um, is it possible that uh, we could take this line of these kingdoms in Daniel chapter 11 and place them on a line altogether? That is, we would see the kingdom of Persia, let's say, represents the, the, the arrival of the second and the kingdom of Greece, the formalization of the second and the kingdom of uh, pagan Rome, uh, the Midnight Cry, and the Kingdom of Papal Rome, uh, the Sunday Law. Is, is that possible that we could do something like that? I'm not saying that that's the best way to do it. But is, should there be something like that where we can take these kingdoms and set them on a line? I think it'd be possible. Yeah. So when we start looking at uh, this Kingdom of Greece, of course, we know once we take way marks on a line, we're zooming in. And so we know that when we're looking at Greece, we're zooming into some way mark in order for it to be a line. That is, there's some line above in which Greece is a way mark. It has to be, or else we couldn't make a line out of it. And and that line, that, that way mark that, that it is, we haven't discerned that. It could be it could be the midnight, it could be the midnight way mark. Um, um, and so that there, there's some logic to that, 
And one of the things is we've seen the symbol of midnight show up in this line, right? But but it also could be, you know, just the arrival of, of the second angel. It's possible as well. So we have to put that aside for now. Just keep it in the back of your mind. We have a line dealing with Greece, and that line, when we zoom into it, represents the entire line, right? It represents our history. Now, um, uh, so when we're addressing um, uh, these details here, this where this is leading us to, we know that this line is not the real actual line, right? It's, it's a way mark within a line. It's not the complete line itself. And this is the one thing that people who haven't been following our studies don't really understand. So when we talk about raffia as future, um, it doesn't mean we're not in raffia now or midnight as future because we can be Zooming into that way mark of Raphia can show this history that's part of that line, right? We understand what I'm saying? That there is way marks in our line that um, are not Raphia itself, but are part of the line that's created by zooming into Raphia. So in a sense, you can say we're in Raphia, just like you can say, since 9-11, we're in the time of the Sunday law. Because we zoom into the Sunday law, in our history, it creates this line that has the first and the second angel's message preceding the Sunday law. Right? So, so this can be true. So when we're talking about, well, Raphia hasn't occurred yet. Well, it, in a sense, if we're zoomed into that way mark that is Raphia, our events are part of Raphael, right? But we still have to distinguish the fact that in this line that, that we are in um, is still something that, in a sense, precedes Raphia as a waymark. Even if it's a zoom into Raphia, events in our line, in our history, are not Raphia itself. And so that means we couldn't have come to Raphia as an event, just like when we zoom into the Sunday law and we see 9-11 as this mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down, we wouldn't say the Sunday law has already happened, right? We're part of the history of the Sunday law, but we're not, we haven't seen the Sunday law yet. And we're part of the history of Raphia, but we haven't seen Raphia yet. But we will shortly, right? Just as we will see the Sunday law shortly but everything in its order. Now, and I just want you to bring bring you, so this brings me a thought, which we can examine here in this context, and that is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we know that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is saying that Christ is not yet returned, right? That he's not, he's not, it's not the time that Christ is going to be here. But is the day of Christ at hand? Is he saying, so let's just read this here. Um, I'll get rid of the Greek here. Um, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor as be, by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, is he saying that the day that the day of Christ is not at hand? What is he saying? Is he saying that the day of Christ is at hand? Well, he says, not, don't be shaken uh, in mind or troubled. Now, he could be saying, you know, the day of Christ is not at hand. But would that be in agreement with 
the scriptures. Is the day of Christ at hand in, in the context of the New Testament? In right. any sense. Right. So the day of Christ is at hand. But he's, he's refining this a little bit. He's saying, even though we're saying that the day of Christ is at hand, there are events that have to happen first. Right? Agreed. Are not we in the same condition when it comes to something like the Sunday law or the second coming? <clears throat> Very much. We're in the time of the Sunday law. We're in the time of the second coming. We're the final generation. But he's just saying, don't be shaken by this because there is things that have to occur first. No. So let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Right. Um, so he knows the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There are things that are already happening. But that wicked has to be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Right. So. So he's saying there's things that have to happen first. So don't put the cart ahead of the horse, right? We know that there is a work to do. Christ is going to come back. Um, now, how long that's going to be from Paul's perspective, I don't know. I don't know if he fully understands the periods of time and how many hundreds of years are going to have to pass before Christ returns. Uh, my view is that they would think that Christ is going to come shortly, um, you know, in their time in some way. So they haven't really understood it. And I think it is even possible that Christ could have returned had the church done its work, that the prophecies of the Bible um, could have led to Christ returning sooner. And that even what happened in connection with the fall of Jerusalem could have been the second coming of Christ had the church done its work but those are speculations you know what ifs are big things right a lot of speculation attached but the point is we know that there are events that have to occur and so somebody's saying the sunday law is going to be coming next year you know or the year after that but is ignoring all of those events that have to occur and especially the responsibility that we have in giving a message and just thinks they can passively, passively wait. And then, you know, the Sunday law is going to happen and they're going to be prepared for it, even though they haven't done the work of warning the world or warning the church, then we would be in this same situation as the early church. So, so that's just an idea that I think we have to consider that we know the day of Christ is at hand. The Bible is, is clear in Paul's day, but he, he's saying, don't be troubled by this because there are things that have to happen first. And we know that that's the case in our history. There are things that have to happen. And so people are ignoring those things. <clears throat> okay, so when we get back to to our paper, our document here. Um, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a history of Greece that leads up to the Sunday law. And uh, did somebody have a comment? I have a question for you. Okay, what's your question? <clears throat> now, I need to I need to kind of set the stage first. So is there is there a way that we could look very briefly at verses 11, 9, and 11, 10? Okay, so 9 and 10 in Daniel chapter 11. Well, we could look at them in our chart, but you want to just look at them in the Bible. In, in the paper that you've got before us. Oh, okay, in the paper? In the paper. Okay, I'll go back to the paper then. So 9 and 10, which go way back here. 
So nine is going to be this verse dealing with. Um, nine is going to be the verse that, that we've looked at saying, so the king of the south, Ptolemy the third, equaling Biden. Yeah. Shall come into his, the USA government. Yeah. Kingdom, Syria, USA land, and shall yeah. return into his own land, Egypt being United Nations, w, the World Health Organization. Yeah. Now, 10, but his, Seleucus, USA, sons, Seleucus the third, Soter, and and Antiochus III Magnus, the apostate republicanism and pro Protestantism, the church state relation, shall be stirred up, desire a war against Egypt or propaganda campaign against wokeism. So the the alternate reading in there for shall be stirred up mm -hmm. was shall war in the 1769 King James. Right. And yeah. so we and have that, this yeah. we have this war going up against wokeism at that time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have a war going on against wokeism. Um now, now it's interesting that word to that's translated as stirred up is one six two four. Okay. So all the digits are attacked are, let me see. No, that's supposed to have a seven, not a two. What's the one six two four? That's some number I've seen before. Uh, oh, never mind. I think I'm getting it mixed up with something else. Okay, never mind. Um, but then we have this word and shall assemble, and that's six twenty two. Right. The word assemble here is, um, I'm looking at it, that's why that box popped up. Uh, asaf, asaf, to gather, to assemble. Um, but it's, it's the symbol we have for FFA for June 22nd, right? So just, just a note on that. But anyway, uh, the sons, this is, um, we're saying that these are representing just like the daughters, the daughter of the king of, of the south. You know, we have now the sons, of course. You know, it's a bit more complicated than that. But the idea is that this is a church state union, um, republicanism and Protestantism that's stirred up against uh, wokeism. Right. That's what we're saying. And then. Okay. So. Okay, so now, we start to go at war. Yeah. Okay, so the the alternate of, as I was starting to say, of the shall, burst shall be stirred up, mm -hmm. the alternate there would be shall war right. in the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be, I mean, it has to do with anger, but the idea is that I put desire to war against Egypt. Right. So that's what it means, the stirred up. It's it's really dealing with war. Right. I, I'm understanding that. So I'm just asking if, if desire to war isn't too tentative. No, it's not. Okay. Because the word it has to do with the anger. Right. So it's the anger that leads to war, right? So okay. a stronger word there. But, but the idea is that it's, it's anger. And they shall assemble a multitude of great forces, raise up a large army, and one son, right, that is, you say, is that Trump? Shall okay. come and overflow and pass through. And, you know, we're still uncertain about some of these applications, but we have the fourth Syrian war and we put their Sunday law. Then shall he and Tychus the third. Republicanism. So we're just saying it's it's not really just necessarily Trump as a president, but a Republican president. We have to decide where we place that. He shall be stirred up even to his fortress. 
he shall return and be stirred up. So we still have to sort out a lot of this, which we're going to do when we go through it a second time and put it on a line. But the idea is we parallel 9 and 10 um, with this word return that um, they're going to return to their fortress, which is the American Constitution. Okay, now we need to keep in mind that the phrase and one shall certainly come the one is a supplied word yes so yeah um i know so it's a supplied word but the okay. idea is, so it could be both i guess but i think because it's in the singular that's why they put it as one right Okay, so if I look at this verse in the Hebrew, I'll do it in this other program where it gives me. Okay, so we got, um, now, and the other thing is it doubles that word. That's why it certainly come. Um, right. Three, one, three, five. So that's, um, I mean, that, that's a common word, word. Let's seeing if it's, what form it's in. Yeah, so it's in the masculine singular. So that's why they have to put one shall certainly come because it's a singular. Um, but that's if they're taking it from the two that are mentioned earlier, two of the sons, because that's plural, right? Right. <clears throat> so we look at, um, just looking at these other words. So the, when it says that they're stirred up, um that's going to be uh, masculine plural, right? So now one shall certainly come and shall be stirred up. Um, let me see here. So then it says one shall certainly come overflow, pass through, and then he shall return and be stirred up, right? So it's going to be that same word uh, that stirred up. Right. It says, now, so, part of the thing why people would say, well, this is to the fortress of the king of the south, because he stirred up uh, to war, right? But this can also just be anger to war. But in this case, he's going to return to his own fortress. He's not going to return to the fortress of the king of the south, but to his own fortress. Is how we've interpreted this end of verse 10. And um, and part <clears throat> part of this in the support for this to being the apostate republicanism and Protestantism is that the other verses that are given reference for overflow and pass through had been mm -hmm. Isaiah 8.8 8 and Daniel 9.26. Now, it's kind of interesting, given the comments that were made yesterday, especially by Pat Rampey, about how um, the movement needs to apologize for July 18th. Mm -hmm that we need to be praying this part of Daniel's prayer. Now, unfortunately, his logic is is very flawed because Daniel's prayer was recognizing all of the things that the church of his time had not done, especially in following the word of God. So if, right. if he's looking to apologize for July 18th, then he's basically saying <clears throat> that everything that the movement has done should be uh, the the thing that should be apologized for. Right. And 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 it doesn't it doesn't make sense because Daniel is apologizing basically for the sins of his people, fulfilling the conditions. He's trying to fulfill the conditions. So that the promise of the return of the land can occur, right? So he right. recognizes 
And so he's doing this individually. He confesses his own sin. But primarily he's confessing the sins of people. Not, definitely not his own personal sins in this regard. Correct. Now, so the overflow and pass through, if we look at the other verses that were there, and I'll just read them briefly. Isaiah 8.8, 8, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach mm-hmm. even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. And then 926, of course, is, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Mm -hmm. So we have this overflowing and pass through. Now, the next portion has another alternate reading where we are saying, then shall he return and be stirred up. And the alternate reading would be, then shall be stirred up again. Now, is that supported in Hebrew? Okay, so that's in verse... Verse 10. Verse 10, shall be stirred up again. It's the portion that, that exists. Yeah, I can see it here. It's just, I, I don't see how they could be stirred up again. I mean, to me, they're just saying, well, they were stirred up before, right, in the first part of the verse, and they're going to be stirred up again. But the first part is both of these songs are stirred up. In the second part, one of them is stirred up because it's in the singular. Right. Okay. And so one of them certainly comes and overflows and passes through and returns and is stirred up even to his fortress. Now, we say the one that, because when you look at the history, we say, well, it's Antiochus III. And, And they're also thinking of that when they're doing this. So they're saying that there's two sons that are stirred up. And then one shall certainly come overflow, pass through, then shall return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Now, so these events, um, uh, we place them historically, um, so we say that this is sort of a type of the Sunday law, this overflowing and passing through. So we're putting this in the time of you know, Trump and Biden and all that. So whether we're doing this correctly or not, we still haven't decided whether what we're doing makes sense, right? But we are saying that um, if we're going to look at what what's happened historically, Seleucus, his sons, Seleucus III and Antiochus III, if that's being referred to, they have to represent something in our history. And we, we haven't been able to just say we can take these kings and make them presidents, right? So they're connected to ideas. In this case, we're saying republicanism and Protestantism. And, and this is this battle, republicanism and Protestantism, against wokeism, right? So that fits, whether that's a correct interpretation in our present truth application or not, we still don't know. Um, but we can see that this has happened since Biden has come into power, right? So the backlash with Trump losing um, has been this situation where right now there's an overwhelming battle against uh, wokeism happening in the alternate media, right? And so when it says one, one son, well, that was Antiochus the third, third, who we're saying was, well, um, is this republicanism, right? A Republican president then, like Trump, 
And it doesn't mean that he has to become the president. Uh, Trump definitely is doing this work. Now, we have this overflowing and passing through. So we're saying, well, is this a Sunday law or is this something else? Because it's a type of the Sunday law. And then shall he, Antiochus III, Republicanism, return to Syria. Um, that is the USA. And be stirred up even to his United States fortress, the American Constitution. And so we can see that this anger, even though Trump loses this election, uh, this could be a reference coming back to run again, right? So, and to say that this is a type of the Sunday law because this overflow and pass through is a type of the Sunday law. So how that fits exactly, I don't know. But all we're, all we're seeing is there's this battle between these ideologies within the United States. But then those things are going to move to on a larger international scale. So I still I still don't have this like completely sorted out how it all would make sense. But that's how we would address these stirred up. These stirred up stirs being stirred up is a desire to war. It's anger, right? Doesn't always lead to war. Um but if if they're stirred up, if one shall certainly come overflow and pass through, and he shall return. So to say to Syria, you know, how that we would look at that, try to understand what this is, to his kingdom, and have this anger, and he's going to re return even to his fortress. So he's returning even to his fortress. But in doing that, this is an anger. And this definitely can describe what's going on in the United States. And we're saying his fortress is the American Constitution. It doesn't mean that they're going to be using it correctly, but that's where they're standing at this time. So this would bring us to our time, just prior to Raphia, right? So we have this battle going on. And then this is going to spread out to the world in what we call the Battle of Raphia. I mean, so it makes sense to me, but I still don't know if it's if there's something that we're missing. Okay, now setting the stage that way, we return to Daniel eleven fourteen to segue into fifteen. <clears throat> now, Daniel eleven fourteen, and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people. The alternate reading on the robbers of thy people and the breakers are the, or at least according to the translators, were the children of robbers. Oh, the children of robbers. Um, yes. So when we look at this, uh, that is the, the Hebrew. Right. So. Right. We kind of miss it, yeah, but if you look at the Strong's numbers, you're going to see um, uh, it's going to have uh, one one two one, and then uh, six five three zero. So one one two one is a son, right? Okay. Ben, right? Like Benjamin, right? So. So that's why they're putting, so it doesn't put that in the King James. It doesn't say the sons of robbers of my people. Right. But the idea is that this is a sons and, and the word really is kind of a tyrant. Right. So, so Peretz comes from 6555, which means violent. It is a tyrant. So these are sons of a tyrant is probably a better way to translate. Um, but the idea is that it's it's a tyrant, a tyrant robs. And, and this is more the action rather than the noun, right? Agreed. So, so, <clears throat> now you can't use tyrant as a verb, you know, he tyranted the people. But you can say he robbed, right? So we got the sons of a tyrant robbing by people. 
and in other so, ways in, yeah. in other ways within the book of daniel we had established that the robbers of thy people had been rome but if these are the children of the robbers would that be apostate protestantism no the idea that i have here of why it's the son is that this is this line from because if you take take this as a tyrant as being you know initially babylon then greece then media persia then rome this is just a continuation of the kingdoms that are dominating God's people. Right. So Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision. That is the vision that includes Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. So this is the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation right this is that's why the sons of the tyrants or tyrant okay in this case let me just take a look here yeah so it's it's the masculine plural uh um so the son of the robbers or the tyrants of thy people. So these are those that are persecuting God's people. So this would be uh, the daily, right? As far as they have to arise to establish the vision of the Kazone. So does that help? <clears throat> okay. So the question that that we're going through here, of course, is that we're we're using this in establishing which vision, since there are multiple visions being used in the Old Testament. This is the Kazon. Got Yes. But that vision is concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. Right. And Rome has to exalt themselves in order to establish that vision. Correct. Because they're going to be the last portion of the daily and they're going to cover all of the transgression of desolation. So that's why it has to be Rome. It can't be a Tychus Epiphanes, as Swearingen suggests. I know on that we're in full agreement. Yeah. I was looking at this given, you know, the time in which Daniel wrote it and the time which it's meant more for, which is us, whether Rome or apostate Protestantism would be the better fit for this time. But I'm not disagreeing with you that this has to do in the underlying sense with Rome. Yeah. And it's the sons, plural, of the tyrants um, against thy people. Well, right? isn't the daily and the transgression which maketh desolate, aren't those both tyrants in their own in their own way yeah yeah and they're also against god's people they, they agreed tyrants of you know of thy people or against the people that you know you have to using tyrants as a verb in this case uh, rather than as a noun so that's why they have robbers but, but those that are destroyers or breakers or different things, right? Um, but it's it's obviously the kazon. So it's the transgression of desolation included as well as the daily. But it's Rome that arises here initially, which is pagan Rome. It comes into play. And they have to exalt themselves to establish the vision. Now, an odd question. Does the transgression which maketh desolate, could that numerically also represent the 1290? Well, yes, because that represents the 1290, because you're going to have the daily taken away 
30 years before the 1260 for uh, the trampling of God's people happens. So the 1290 begins with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the transgression and desolation. So why, why numerically, why do you need the 1290 there? Well, I'm just, I, I'm just looking at different symbols because one of the things that, that we've established and we've held on to for years has been by the testimony of two or more shall a thing be established. And we never seem to have a second witness for the 1290. So just like I said, it's an odd question. Okay. Now. Well, I think we have lots of second witnesses for the 1290, but. Okay. So. Uh, and, and the part of that is just understanding that cha- Daniel chapter 12, verse 7 is referring to the 1260 um, for the scattering of the power of the holy people, referring to the first 1260, not the second. That actually helps place uh, the understanding of that. So the taking away of the daily in Daniel 11, uh, verse um, 31 and 12 verse uh, 11, um, those two, you, you have to understand where that taking away of the daily is. And so it, it, to me, it's a witness of the 1290. Okay. Anyway. Mm-hmm. So now in Daniel eleven fifteen. So the king yeah. of the north, which we're placing as Antiochus III, republicanism in the U.S., shall come and shall cast up a mount, siege, or persecution, mm-hmm. and take the most fenced cities. Now, the according to the translators, the alternate Hebrew would be the city of munitions. Is this supported within the hebrew well it's i don't know, i don't know about munitions because fence cities refers to a fortification doesn't say anything about munitions in the hebrew okay so and the arms of the south shall not withstand and so the arms of the south Placing the Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, the radical left, shall not withstand, so lose the Battle of Paneum. Mm-hmm. Neither his chosen people. Now, here again, the translators would have this as neither the people of his choices. Yeah. So these are the people <clears throat> of the king of the north. Yeah, so we're saying um we're saying or we're asking is, well this is going to be Rome's chosen people. Okay. Right, at least that's originally okay. So we we've tried to figure this out. So we still don't fully understand how to do it. So we were looking at this uh, yesterday, right? So we say that the rad- radical West loses this ideological battle. Now, dealing with the idea of neither, you know, what is that referring to? Neither what? I mean, are they not, are they going to lose? Are they not going to stand? Right? The yeah, idea is there shall, Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now, that word withstand is stand, right? Stand up. So somebody's not going to be able to stand up, right? And and we're saying that, but there is somebody that is, and in verse 16, which we have to go all the way over to here, um, pagan Rome is the one that's going to stand up. Right, he, they they come against him, but he pay it, and so we have to sort out verse sixteen. So do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. Right, 
and he shall stand. You know, again, you're going to see that same idea. So there's all of this standing going on, standing up. So to say to withstand, no strength to withstand, I mean, there's no strength to stand up. Right? Okay. So, so yeah, we, we kind of got a bit sidetracked looking at Swearingen's uh, interpretation of this. So, you know, Rome, the papacy's chosen people, Scopius and others, we're, we have to change that. We have to say, well, that can't be right. But that's what we had there, right? So, so the chosen people is still something we have to decide on, but also about this neither. And, and it says, uh, the arms of the South shall not withstand, right? Again, I think we should just translate this differently. So when I, when I look at these verses, uh, the arms of the South shall not withstand, right? So the way that they're translating, neither his chosen people, that is Scopius and those others, right? That's the way that it would be understood by Uriah Smith. And, and, and they're not going to be able to, to stand because they don't have the strength to, right? So that that's the idea. But if this is Rome's, we look at verse 16. Verse 16 is Rome that does stand. Right? Okay. In our understanding of it, but he that cometh against him to do uh, shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. That is the papist, that is Rome, right? That does according to his will. And it's going to be matched up to verse 31 when the papacy does according to his will, right? Okay. Um now you're now you're opening another door for right. So it's actually going to be verse thirty six, but it's going to start with the papacy. Arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the daily. Right, that's going to be the papacy. And in verse thirty six of Daniel eleven, the king shall do according to his will, shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Right. Um, so he does according to his will. So we're connecting. Rome does according to its will when it rises and the papacy does according to its will and Greece does according to its will and, and Medo-Persia does according to its will. This is showing the rising up of this kingdom, right? It's, it's actions as this persecutory power. So, you know, what we're dealing with, with Swearingen is he's, he's seeing this as all being a tie kiss epiphanies. Right. In in his interpretation of this, which just doesn't work. So we have to get rid of his interpretation out of this. So it can't be Rome, Rome's people, neither his Rome's. The his has to be something else that I don't know. Um, or we have to figure out if this is Rome, how does that that happen right so um yeah it's such a mess right now until we get this all sorted out so the king of the north in verse 15 that's republicanism of the u.s shall come now what i'm going to do is i'm going to grab this verse 16 um and i think this just goes here and attach it to what we're doing here you know, to me, these follow logically one after the other. Oops. You didn't go far enough. Uh, that's not all of what, what more do I need for verse 16? Whoops. It should end with by his hand be consumed. Okay. Grab more of that. So I need this then. Oh, so he's going to put pagan Rome in there. I don't, I don't quite understand his putting a tie kiss in there. Just throws it all off. Swearingen is very confusing because a lot of his 
theology seems to be derived from apostate Protestantism. Yeah. Well, and that's the problem I find with many Adventists who are trying to interpret prophecy is one is they don't study the way that we do. And even ones that think they're following Miller's rules aren't because they don't really understand them. Um, but they, they also have started down a path that they're with blinders on the sides. So there's just things they're not willing to look at to see or consider. They're caught in this dialectic that has existed for a long time about how to understand it's either this or it's that. Right. So it doesn't allow them to be very open minded. Um, this. Okay, so we got verse 16 in here. So when it says, but he pagan Rome that cometh against him. So obviously where he's placing this, we're going to have to reconsider. So we're, we're going to almost get rid of swearing and try to figure out what this is about. Right. Um, uh, so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount in verse 15. And take right. the most and cities. So this is after Battle of Paneum, right? But it's connected with it. the arms of the south. So it just goes back the Egyptian under, army under Ptolemy V, which we're saying is a radical one, shall not withstand. Now, so this idea is uh, stand up. Right? That's the idea of, of this shall not stand. They shall not stand up. It's in here like that. Oops. Okay. So they shall not stand up. So this standing up is a, a, an important point because if we're saying that, um, in this in this whole, whole thing dealing with the Battle of Raphia, even though the South wins, right? Wokeism, atheism, communism, all these different isms sort of win, they don't stand up. They, Agreed. Right? No. That's they don't stand up. Okay. And then it says neither his chosen people. So we're saying, well, you know, that's what Uriah Smith is saying. Rome's chosen people. Okay. So Scopius and others. And, and so we're saying, well, that made more sense than what Swearingen was trying to say, which I can't remember what it was, but this is what Stephen had suggested. But we're saying, well, no, we could do something different because we need to say, well, you know, neither is chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to stand. So who doesn't have strength to stand? Because it said, uh, the king of the south shall not stand up. And if you're just going to take that out of there, neither shall there be any strength to withstand, to stand up. Well, that would seem kind of redundant, Right. So the question is, is this introducing someone else? The idea is, well, this is Rome. But how else could we look at this? I know this must be tedious for people watching us sort of struggle through these. Uh, well, the, the point, versus, when I said that you'd opened up another door, mm -hmm. we were dealing with 1115 about the cities of munition. If we compare that with 1138, in the alternate Hebrew, again, munitions is raised. But yeah, here so, yeah. so what we're dealing with there is um, in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces or fortresses, right? right. And um, now this, of course, is talking about the papacy. Correct. And this means a fortified place. Right, a defense, rock, a strength. Now, 
So forget about the mu mu munitions there. I mean, I don't think munitions are really uh, the main idea. The main idea is it's a fortress. But it does connect us to that, right? Well, well. My, my point being, when we're looking at this on munitions, the biggest things that the that Rome has been using has been the length of time where they had changed the Sabbath or changed the solemnity of the Sabbath and placed it on Sunday and the, their state of the dead and the fact that they have been around for so many centuries. Now, mm -hmm. those are kind of their munitions. But here in Daniel eleven sixteen, he that cometh against him, we're talking about king of the north coming against the king of the south, shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land or in the goodly land, the land of ornament, which by his hand shall be consumed. Now, isn't today's glorious land, today's goodly land, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, we've always taken that the glorious land is the United States. Okay. So, so Jeff has always stood against that interpretation. Okay. So if it, if it is the United States, then if he shall stand in the glorious land using what you just put up on the screen, that the United States for all intents and purposes, would be conquered by the king of the north, conquered by Rome. Right. So so what ends up happening here? So how we understand this historically is that Rome takes over the kingdom of the north, right? Okay. Now, when do we place that generally? Wouldn't we place that just before the Sunday law? No, but I mean, historically, where, when does Rome defeat Greece? Rome defeats Greece in 191 BC. Okay. Now, that's, that's not, I mean, even though we have that battle of, uh, Thermopylae, um, you know, they, you'll see different dates depending on how it's understood. You know, some put 146 BC, right? But we have to look at it from uh, the biblical perspective, which is from the land of Israel, right? Okay. So, um, so the way that Miller looked at it is he said, well, that's going to be 158 because it had to do with uh, this treaty, right? But one, 158 was the Jews seeking an alliance, a league with Rome. Right. And so the way that Miller said it has to do when this kingdom comes in contact with God's people. Right. All right. Well, he put 168, 158. OK. Now, I, um, your, yeah. your question had been, when does Rome defeat Greece? And I right. answered that. Yeah. And that's correct. So right. but you know, some people put it as 146. So they no. have about growth. So. But what I'm saying is we could have these different dates, but the one from the biblical perspective that Miller chose had to do with its relation, the Jewish people's relationship with Rome. Because what's happened with Rome and Greece, if it's not affecting the land of Israel directly at that time, then that nation isn't coming into being the, the nation that's dominating God's people. So when it, when it defeats Greece isn't particularly the date that we would use to mark it, right? That's why Miller chooses 158. Okay, so just clarifying that point. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, 
you know, we see that Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. Right? That's the robbers of thy people are going to be Rome, pagan Rome. But they shall fall. So then when we get, so the king of the north shall come up and cast them out and take the most fenced cities. Well, we know that in this battle between uh, the Ptolemic Empire and the Seleucid Empire, Rome exalts itself. Right? That is, it tries to hinder what the king of the north is doing because it doesn't want it to become too powerful. It doesn't want it to come and conquer Egypt. So that's why this, all this stuff in Uriah Smith's dealing with Scopius and so forth is because he's looking at that history in connection with Paneum, which we are as well. And, and so the king of the north is going to take some of this territory that had been annexed by the, by the Ptolemic Empire, right? Um, and so then when we get to verse 16, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. Well, this he is going to be Rome, right? Correct. Okay. Now, Rome then becomes the king of the north. Right? When he, he does according to his will, and no one can stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land. So where would we place that he stands in the glorious land? When is the siege of Jerusalem by Rome? It's going to be 63 BC, right? I believe. When, I always get it mixed up. Is it 36 or 63? No, no, no. It, ha it has to be 63. Okay, right. So it's 63. You're talking about like the first one. That's when... Rome stands in the Holy Land, pagan Rome, the you're, first time. You're speaking of when Pompey takes Jerusalem. Right. Right. So that's going to be 63 BC. So that's where it leads us to. Here. So he shall stand in the glorious land. That's 63 BC, which by his hand shall be consumed. Did that happen? Did pagan Rome consume the glorious land? Well, okay. You're, the word that you're, you, that we're focusing here on this for consumed has to do with its end. So that's going to refer to what happens with 70 AD and, and the end of God's people, right? They're going to, all that history that deals within Daniel chapter 9, dealing from the time of the Messiah is going to be cut off, and then you're going to have the city and the sanctuary destroyed. That 3615, that consumed means to end, whether intransitively to cease, be finished, Paris, or transitively to complete, prepare, consume. So it's going to accomplish. Have been taken away, yes. Um, yes, so this this has to do laid waste, right? All those types of things. So that's going to happen by Rome. So it's it's going to begin in 63 BC, and it's going to continue all the way up to the destruction of Jerusalem, and even further, but at least to the destruction of Jerusalem prophetically and the temple in 70 AD. Right? So that's what's being referred to. So this So this is pagan Rome. And it becomes the king of the north at this point. And we would we would use to support this the the first evidence for the use of this word, which is in Genesis two one and two two. Uh, consumed, you're talking about? Yeah. Same word. It can also be translated as finished or ended, right? Yeah. So Genesis two. Uh, verse one, um, God end. finished, right. Um, yeah, just means to end. Yeah. Um, and so he, uh, finished his work, ended. God ended his work, right? So that's that, and that's why it has these different definitions. Um, but it, the idea is that it's going to consume in, in this case or end. 
the glorious land, right? So this this makes sense in the context of what we're studying here. Right? This this fits in perfectly with Rome, right? Okay. So the historical application is pretty clear. Now, do, shall do according to his will. But we have cast and tie kissed the fourth out of Egypt, eight Jewish people against Syria through the Jewish League. Well, we would we would have to say that this is wrong. Correct. I mean, I would put 191 BC here. Very much correct. Okay. So, because that's when he's going to stand, right? And he and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land as well. So you're going to have him standing in the glorious land. So all of this has to do with the fact that pagan Rome conquers Syria, the Seleucid Empire. So, you know, this isn't anti now Antiochus the fourth, he's going to be later, right? So we just say Seleucid Syria. Seleucid Empire. And he does according to his will. In 191. So he then becomes the king of the north prophetically. He comes or is revealed as? Well, he becomes. I mean, in order to become the king of the north, he has to conquer the king of the north. Okay. Right. And, and because we're dealing here with these literal sort of terms, he possesses that territory. Okay. Now, once we move to the papacy, the king of the north doesn't have to possess that territory. King of the south doesn't have to possess a certain territory. Um, just has to have those characteristics. It's applied spiritually, but it comes from the type of the literal, right? So when you look at Egypt and you look at the, at France, it's not that France uh, possesses Egypt. It's just that France has the characteristics of Egypt, of the king of the south. It's atheism and it's licentiousness. Right? Um, Sodom and Egypt. Okay. So, so we know though that we can take verse 16 and we can parallel it. This is pagan Rome with Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45. Right? So pagan Rome is going to typify what happens uh, with papal Rome at the end of the world. And that makes sense because we already understand that. Because when we look at Daniel chapter 11, let's uh, let's just go there to these other verses. We know these verses pretty well, but you know, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him with whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, many ships. He'll enter into the country, shall overflow and pass over. So we just had that language in Daniel 11 um, earlier in verse... Is that verse 14 or 15? I can't remember. And he shall also enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown, but he shall escape out of his hand. So we know this entering into the glorious land, and then these final events dealing with the Sunday law, obviously are paralleled first by pagan Rome, right? So what happens with papal Rome happens with uh, pagan Rome first. What was that? Yeah. So this overflowing and passing through is happening earlier in verse 10. But you're going to see that all that language uh, here is dealing with first Greece. And then in verse 16, he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. None shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land. So when we first were looking at Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we weren't going back to these verses and seeing a parallel with our time. Right. Correct. Uh, I think we were seeing, though, that these did typify our time in a certain sense, that we we understood that what happened with pagan Rome entering into the glorious land or standing in the glorious land was parallel to the papacy standing in the glorious land, right? What, What we didn't do is say, well, in our time, we can go back to these histories in Daniel chapter 11 and just lay them over top. We didn't do that at first. Even though we should have been able to see that we could. Because if it typifies it, 
then it should be describing our history. That's what we finally decided um, in 2016. It took us that long really to do that. 2015, maybe a little bit from the beginning of Daniel chapter 11, but 2016 to actually apply this and, and more even so into 2017, because it's going to be the end of 2016. Now, so Rome comes in to establish the vision in verse 14. Now, where did we place Rome establishing the vision in our history? Does anybody remember where Jeff placed this? Would we be looking at it being established in 1989? Okay, so it it's connected with what ends up resulting in 1989. That is, when uh, Reagan and Pope John Paul II work together to overthrow the Soviet Union, which is the result Right? right? Rome has exalted itself to establish the vision. But it does this early, right? That is, Rome exalts itself to sta- establish the vision before it actually stands up. So Jeff just says, you know, they come in prematurely, but but the papacy is going to be there at the end of the world with the Sunday law. So we can see this here with Rome coming into this history, dealing with, you know, Raphia and then, and and Paninian, right, in that history. Um, But yet it doesn't really come into play until 63 BC to 70 AD, right? That it actually is directly persecuting God's people. Now they have the league, so you could put the league there in 158, right? And and I don't think actually that Miller is correct. Um, I mean, he's correct about 158, but I mean, he's not correct about where we would start to count the kingdom of Rome. Because I believe that we would start to count it in 63 BC, as far as its effect upon God's people. But he is correct in marking 158 because that gives us that 666 years to 508. So it's just not as clear cut as Miller tried to place it. You know, that you have Greece, Rome comes and it has to continue. There's nothing saying that there is, because he believed that once the 2520 started, that they were never again an independent independent nation. And yet they were. So we know that the land of Judea was independent from either Greece or Rome, at least from uh, 129 to 63 BC. So there's this whole period of time where neither Greece or Rome is oppressing God's people. We have Judean independence. And, and this was you know, partly won through what happened with the Maccabean revolt and so on. This continued, so they had this independence. But in 63 BC, Rome comes and besieges Jerusalem. And then Ju- Jerusalem is under Rome. The Jews are under Roman rule, but not till then. Now you could say, well, they made this agreement, and once that agreement is put into effect in 158, they sort of are, right? Because that league with Rome allowed them to lead to their independence. But Rome isn't really holding this league over their head in order to come against them. They're just, Rome is just conquering, right? What it does and decides to conquer Jerusalem, which is kind of a simplification of that history. <clears throat> so if we're going to draw these on the line, one thing that we can see about this line, so once we get to Rome, that this line is going to parallel, just like we did with Greece, and just like we did with Persia, it's going to parallel our history. And there's this preliminary history that has to do with the Battle of Raffi and Panea, that if we're going to place it on our line, like the historical Battle of Raffi and Panea, that it's not going to be till 11 verse 16, and we have to decide that, how that happens, how we take pagan Rome and this history, we haven't looked at it, 
and applied it yet in the present true sense. But how we're going to take this history of Rome, that somewhere it's going to start, just like we have with, with um, Greece, we have this, this uh, 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 war, this uh, Afghan-Soviet um, war. I would think that we would have to have the preamble to the time of the end dealing with Rome as being this alliance between the United States and the papacy, the Vatican, right? Ma'am? So we would need to then find dates connected with uh, Reagan and the Pope prior to November 9th, 1989, because that's going to be the end result. And and I don't know what those dates are. I have never really looked into them in detail. When did they first meet? When did this alliance start? Uh, what are the, um, the prophetic events or markers in that alliance? I mean, obviously, we always just say, well, the time of the end is November 9th, 1989. But we know when we looked at Greece, we had this this war from December 24th, 1979 to February 15th, 1989 that preceded that. So we should have something similar. Right. So it's one thing that we're going to have to look at when we start dealing with Rome's line. But right now, we're still going to finish off Greece's line and we're going to have to try to see how we can do that. But Rome comes in earlier in this time. So if we're going to look at a parallel to our history, when the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, that wouldn't be November 9th, 1989. It would be earlier. Any other thoughts on this? I don't know if, if that makes sense to people or not. Much of the point that you've been presenting, mm -hmm. I've been considering, but we need, you know, like you just said, we're going to need to put some dates to some of this. Yeah, and, and those dates probably will work with these symbols and these spans of time. Um, because that's what's happened already. Um, so it's just something that, you know, we haven't really considered, at least I haven't. Okay. But there must be some uh, uh, history of this that we can look up. I mean, well, I mean, let, let's let's be direct. When Reagan sent his ambassador to the Pope, isn't that the same as uh, the Maccabees sending an ambassador to Rome? Okay, so um, yeah, well, that's going to be when uh, I'm trying to find that out here. Well, okay. Mm. 10th of January of 84. Oh, is it that early? Okay. Um, Okay, so the United States and the Holy See established diplomatic relations. Um, and it's interesting, too, because uh, uh, so they had broken off diplomatic relations with the Vatican in 1776, or, no, or that's the first time they have diplomatic relations with the Vatican or something. I'm just trying to figure this out here. Okay, so let me see. I'm just looking at the history. Uh, so they had relation with the papal states, actually, a consular relation. What's consular? I mean, that would be a consulate. Correct. It means so, that there's no official um, ambassadorial relationship. So 1797 to 1870. Yeah, because in, in 1789, Benjamin Franklin received an emissary from Pius VI. Yeah. And that emissary asked a simple question. Would George Washington permit the Pope to appoint a bishop in America? And at that time, in 1789, Washington replied yes. Okay. But it was... Okay. It was eight years later, in 1797, 
that John Adams named Giovanni Sartori as the first American consul to the Papal States. And that was a position that existed until 1848 under James Polk. And Polk is the one, a Democrat, that elevated this from consul to more of an ambassadorial status. Okay, so that's going to be interesting looking at uh, that. I mean, during the Civil War, Pius IX maintained his communications primarily on both sides between the Union and the Confederacy. Okay, Okay. so anyway, that's going to be when we get into Rome. We have to finish off Greece. Right. But but you can see what we're doing, you know, for anybody watching who can – sit through these tedious uh, discussions is going back and forth and um, trying to understand this, trying to decide. You can see that the process we're going through is a valid process. I mean, we're trying to understand the history correctly in relationship to Daniel chapter 11. And, and we've gone through this before, but we had lots of problems, lots of things that we see differently now. And then we have to also recognize uh, the present truth application. And we want to do it correctly. So first we have to get the historical application correct. If we're going to make an application to our time. And then we have these symbols that attach us to our time. And, and I think these are fairly solid. We have some things that are extremely unlikely to have fit unless what we're doing is solid. So um, anyway, we're going to come back to this tomorrow. Let's uh, close with prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had to study this morning. And we know that this is uh, difficult for us to understand, Lord. And we pray just for wisdom as we study this individually. Uh, We pray that those watching online who have observations that you have given them, that they can share them with us, and that that we can correct any errors we may have in our understanding. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.